eight climbing Sherpas, six cooks, and five base camp staff. My name is Kami Sherpa. My name is Dawa Sherpa. My name is Lapa Gelzi Sherpa. My name is Zhang Nima Sherpa. My name is Dadang Bu Sherpa. I think two ten Ibris. Two ten Ibris. The first time is 1988. This is the second time to Ibris. I am one ten summit Ibris. 95 and 96 and also 97. I try to summit this time. I have confidence that this year I'll be able to uh, step on this great mountain. One of the Sherpas on the team, Dawa, will try to reach the summit of Everest for the first time. Like other Sherpas, he reveres the mountain as the dwelling place of a deity. For me and for my community, for all Sherpas, this is real God. We have lots of respect for this mountain. I hope the great mother goddess let me stand once on top of it. John Ling Tenzing Norgay will be supporting the expedition at base camp. He climbed Everest in 1996 when 15 people died on the mountain and then promised his family he would never climb it again. To his culture, the mountain isn't just rock and ice. It's the home of Chomalongma, the mother goddess of the world. Before facing the perils of the mountain, the Sherpas and climbers show their respect by offering barley flour to the goddess. There's so much danger on the mountain, but they believe in the Chomalongma, you know, the mother goddess Everest. They perform religious ceremonies, they pray, they light juniper before they head up the mountain. What we say is walking into the lap of the mother. I have been to Everest six times. So the difficulty is always the same. We have to carry loads. We also have to think about rest. We always consult with the lamas and have them pray for us, for protection, so nothing happens to us. Why do Sherpas climb? For money. You have to take risk to earn it. they're five, six stories high and they do fall over quite regularly. And you've just got to hope that you're not there when it happens. If the ice fall decides to shift and big blocks fall over, you're going to get killed. When British climbers first set eyes on the Kungu ice fall, they declared it impassable. In 1951, they made an attempt, but failed to get through, stopped short by a huge crevasse at the top. They would have to try again the following year, if they could get a permit. Today, an unlimited number of Everest permits are granted, but back then, Nepal issued only two permits per year, and in 1952, the British got a nasty surprise. Well, the wily old Swiss snapped them there and grabbed not just one, but two uh, permits to climb the mountain and prevented the British from, from climbing it when they wanted to. The British really felt Everest was their mountain, and it was a very difficult time for them. In 1952, there was no route or fixed road. 
We brought some thin rope from the villages. That was all that we had then. The largest crevasses posed the biggest problem for the Swiss. Could they be spanned with only rope? There were big crevasses, very big. Some were far too wide. We also had to pull people across the ropes. First we took loads and then people. Although Sherpas had lived in the mountains for centuries, few had ever climbed on glaciers. When foreign expeditions provided them with strange new clothing and odd climbing tools like crampons and ice axes, it required some getting used to. I had never used boots, windproof jackets, or any climbing equipment before. And I damaged the clothing the first day with my crampons. The Sherpas carried tree trunks about 30 miles from the forest below to help span crevasses. Did you ever get stuck with the crampons? Just stuck. Yeah. Hard to lift up. They used timbers to span these crevasses, and now we've got, on this one, three aluminum ladders that you used to paint the side of your garage lashed together with some old cord. And it's a little nerve-wracking going over this because we're 100 feet down to the bottom of this crevasse. With daring, skill, and a good sense of balance, the Swiss were the first to successfully navigate through the maze of ice. For the first time ever, men looked into the valley of the Western Coon, the gateway to the upper mountain. Five hours after leaving base camp, and 2,000 feet higher on the mountain, the team reaches Camp 1 above the icefall. But they're not alone for long. At Camp 1, we set up our tents. We had a beautiful spot, and 24 hours later, we had a Russian team camp about 30 feet away from us, and a uh, Iranian team camp another 20 feet away from us, and it sort of shocked us that people would want to crowd us like that. And, and then you've got issues of hygiene, where people are going to the bathroom, what they're doing with their pee bottles. Perhaps because of the bad hygiene at Camp One, overnight Peter Hillary becomes dangerously ill. I don't know how many times I went out to vomit. It sounded like it was all dry heaves. I must admit, when I called out to you, I was pretty scared. Yeah. Oh, f hey. Anyone would be. Yeah, we'll get you through this. Peter Hillary descends to base camp where he can recover quickly at lower altitude. But there's worry that he'll fall too far behind in the most critical step in climbing Mount Everest, adjusting to high altitude. Brent Bishop and expedition leader Pete Athens continue higher into the Western Coombe. The Western Coombe is a valley that is formed by Everest, the west shoulder of Everest, Lhotse and Nupse. Sometimes it's referred to as the Valley of Silence. We're up here at above 20,000 feet, and you'd think that it'd be really cold, but it's going to be about 90 plus degrees in the sun up here, and it's a, just one big reflecting oven. It's really hot. It's rush hour on Everest, and a hundred Sherpas truck food and equipment up to Camp 2 from base. We Sherpas, having lived at high altitudes for so many generations, are able to adapt to this high altitude better than any other humans in the world. So therefore, we're able to climb easier. We're born here. We've grown up here. This is our land. This is our place. So it's pretty natural for us. 
from camp to the base, each Sherpa does it 15 to 20 times, and from camp two to South Goal, each Sherpa does it around 10 times. You will never see a Sherpa climbing this mountain out of pleasure. They climb because it's a livelihood. It is very difficult for my children when I'm away. I'm usually away for several months. My older son Pemba is five and Pasang is four. Hey Pemba, the man asked you, is it difficult for you when I'm away from home? There's a lot of money involved in this. It's high stakes and it's worth it for them. A lot of Sherpas have made a lot of money. They own property and they're able to send their children to school in Kathmandu. Sherpas are the unsung heroes of mountaineering. Sometimes I feel disappointed when people write books and you know, they say, oh, I got to the summit and uh, it's all about them. And I got to the summit with five Sherpas. It's like, okay, you know, uh, how about having some names and where they're from, their age, maybe a little bit about their character. Because it's all teamwork. This year at Camp 2, we've got approximately six expeditions, a guided group that's being run by guys from New Zealand. There's a group of Korean climbers who are up slightly above that, and then another group of Americans above that, and I think we're going to see more people moving in here, carving out their presence. Brent Bishop and Pete Athens leave Camp 2. Unlike most climbers who take the southeast ridge route, they plan to climb the more technically difficult West Ridge to the summit. This route scares me. It's a dangerous route and we're off by ourselves so that if things go wrong, we might as well be a long way away. Between the fear and the workload and, and what lies ahead and the duration of what lies ahead, it's intimidating. In 1963, two Americans, Willie Unsold and Tom Hornbein, made mountaineering history by pioneering a route up Everest's daunting West Ridge. Brent's father climbed high on the West Ridge, but he reached the summit by the traditional Southeast Ridge route. For Brent, climbing the West Ridge will fulfill his dream of attempting Everest the way his father did as an explorer approaching the unknown. When Willie Unsold and Tom Hornbein did it 40 years ago, it was the most significant American achievement in the Himalayas and still remains that today. The West Ridge has only been climbed six times. It's had 40 attempts on it and 23 people have been killed on it. Because they're on their own, they have to do triple the work, picking a route fixing their own lines and carrying all their gear. Pete's about to uh, take one of the lines, they're 100 meters each, and run it out and put in another anchor. <laughs> hey Pete, yeah. you live? Yeah, I'm hooked in. Okay. Pete clipped the rope through our high point, through a sling and a carabiner and a good ice crew. And I'm paying the rope out to him and belaying him so that if he falls, I can lock this belay device down and stop his fall. They're headed to a distant couloir at 24,000 feet where they'll put in their next camp. <coughs> You know, those early teams, Ed Hillary, you know, that American team from 63, you know, they came up here and they, you know, just sort of, here was Everest in front of them and they had to figure it out. Now you pay your $65,000 and you clip into the lines and still it's an unbelievable thing to do, but you're not figuring it out. Pete and I have already had eight forays on the West Ridge trying to get to 24,000 feet, fixing our own lines, carrying loads, 
and hauling gear up there. So the, the workload is just breaking me down. And every day getting up and working hard and it's taking its toll on my body. They plan to leave camp two after a few days, but they're pinned down by the wind and can't move higher. Peter Hillary, now recovered and at Camp 2, watches climbers trying to reach Camp 3 on the Lhotse face. What we've had here over the last 24 hours is jet stream winds just blasting over the summit of Everest. And you can see tents have been flattened and ripped all around the camp. And we've got collapsed tents everywhere. Pete and Brent have been forced off their West Ridge route. chill, poor visibility, and the possibility of losing camp pose the biggest danger. Some of the Sherpas have been standing for hours, pushing against the tent poles so they won't collapse. Others are outside, tying down reinforcements. Everyone's got their backs to the walls of their tents and they're holding on. Probably blowing at about 60 miles an hour out there. So according to the weather reports that we have, this is supposed to go on for about another day and a half at least. It's probably more like double this on the summit. The windstorm dies as quickly as it had arrived. For the Sherpas, it is a clear warning from the mountain deity that it's time to retreat off Everest, back to base camp to rest, before trying to go higher. The incredible thing about 1953 is what was happening at the time. The Second World War had just ended. The whole of Europe was a mess. It had been bombed to the ground, and the world was trying to rebuild itself. There was a lot of optimism. And then suddenly, in the UK, there was a coronation of a new young queen, and just to make it even better, uh, a British expedition climbed to the summit of Mount Everest, and it was, it was an incredible time. What should have been a celebration for Tenzing, Hillary, and the expedition leader, Colonel Hunt, turned into trying times. And they trekked out of the mountains, and progressively people came out of the villages and threw garlands of flowers and, and red dye to bless them. And they arrived in Kathmandu, and quite a contingent of media were there. Everybody shouted, our Tenzing climbed the top of the world as if he was God. And Hillary and uh, Hunt and the rest of the team were sort of ignored. I think it was stressful. There was a lot of pressure put upon them. Who actually put their, put their boot on the summit first? During that time, my father signed a statement. And my father didn't know how to read or write, and uh, he just signed it. And apparently that statement said that he climbed first. The whole British team were upset. Then Colonel Hunt got angry and he wrote a statement saying that Tenzing is just a Sherpa, you know, he does not have technical experience and, you know, so he's, he's not able to climb first. A lot of uh, backbiting went on between the British and my father. 
and he was totally innocent. He had no idea what was going on. After he climbed the mountain, his life became more complicated. A lot of offers coming in, you know, people putting uh, words in his mouth, having him sign papers. Deep down in his heart, he might have thought that maybe I shouldn't have climbed this mountain. I think my father and Hillary, they were puppets of the big political world. Later on, they signed a statement saying that we reached almost together. Almost together is what the public would have to live with for another 40 years. Tenzing and Hillary made an agreement not to tell the world who was first. More importantly, they wanted to be known as equal partners. The beekeeper from New Zealand and the Sherpa from the foothills of Everest. Another morning at Camp 2. It's about 5.45. Another beautiful day. But we wouldn't know because we haven't been out yet. Peter Hillary and Dawa leave Camp 2 for their move up to 3. They're now climbing as partners, like Peter's father and Tenzing, and will need to rely on each other in the event of accident. It's the ethic of climbing, the brotherhood of the rope, and some partnerships are more productive than others. Let's see, we're moving fast this morning. Uh, Get up. Get up. Today, suddenly, I'm climbing with Peter Hillary. His father, Sir Edmund Hillary, is such a famous guy. His nickname is Godfather of Crumble. He did so much. Courtesy of Sir Edmund Hillary. Sherpa is an engineer, they are doctors, they are pilots, and, uh, you know. And a few of them still climber like me, <laughs> but still, it's a very big thing. All right, we're getting up, getting up. We're, we're already late, but two experienced mountaineers moving fast. My pee bottle's frozen. You know, sometimes I can't believe. Sometimes I turn around and see Peter Hillary side behind me, and I think myself, oh. <laughs> what a bright day. <laughs> In 1952, Tenzing Norgay was the Sherpa leader for both of the Swiss attempts on Everest. They knew he had more experience than anyone on the mountain. These would be his fifth and sixth expeditions to Everest. To the Swiss, Tenzing was more than a climbing Sherpa. He was treated as a full member of the team. He was very close to the Swiss, especially with Ramon Lambert. They were almost like brothers because they went through so much on this mountain together. The Swiss were mountain people. They identified with the Sherpas and treated them as equals sharing meals and tents with them. It was the Swiss and the Sherpas in 1952 who discovered the route climbers still use today. They went higher than anyone had ever been. They were basically the pioneers opening this route through the ice fall, which is now what we call the classic route, which everybody takes today to the Southeast Ridge. These guys had no idea what to expect. They had no idea what was going to happen to them. Many believe the Swiss deserve half the glory for the British achievement on Everest a year later. The British learned a lot from the Swiss experience and from my father being on this mountain. They used a lot of the oxygen that was left by the Swiss, a lot of the food and um, you know, some of the equipment. So they did benefit from the Swiss expedition. Eight hours after leaving Camp 3, Peter Hillary and Dawa Sherpa have reached the South Col. People at the South Col are really pushed to their limits. 
the feeling that I get is one of fear because this is a place that sometimes people don't come home from. It's extreme. I think it was a group of German climbers who described going above 8,000 meters as going into the death zone. If you make mistakes up above 26,000 feet, there's a very high chance that you will pay very dearly. After 10 expeditions, this will be Dawa's first chance to attempt the summit. I respect this mountain very much. If I climb once, that's gonna be enough for me. It's very hard. It's very tough. We have saying, before you climb mountain, pay all the debts, because no guarantee you'll be back to home. Jumbling, jumbling. This is South Cold. Do you copy? Back on the southeast ridge route, Peter Hillary and Dawa are poised to leave for the summit, but the winds are holding them back. Did you understand that? No. This could be it for Peter Hillary and Dawa's summit attempt this year. High winds are forecast to continue. Disheartened, Peter Hillary calls his father on a satellite phone. Hi, Dad. We've really struck a patch of strong winds, and it looks like we're going to be forced down off the mountain. I don't think we're going to get up at this time, Dad. Fifty years after his father's success, Peter has to face disappointment. The thing that really counteracts that disappointment is that if you don't turn around, you're probably going to die. So the benefit is that you turn around and live. Dawa is even more distraught about turning back. He has a son at home with cerebral palsy and doesn't envision coming back again for another attempt. Sometimes life is bigger than this mountain. If bad weather or whatever, go to see our family. Maybe you don't come back. I tried my best. Forget it. I had some kind of frustration inside of me because it was my chance to climb this mountain. I was so angry with this mountain because uh, mentally I took this mountain, not a pile of rock. I took it as a live thing, which can feel, which can understand. I was so angry with this mountain. I said, you go to hell, I'm not going to come back. In 1952, on the Swiss expedition, Tenzing and Raymond Lambert suffered an even more bitter heartache. They got to within 800 feet of the summit and were forced to turn back. It was an impressive achievement, but a lifelong disappointment for Tenzing. He always wished that uh, he, he had climbed it in 52 with the Swiss. Immediately after the expedition, Tenzing, exhausted from two attempts in one year, was bedridden. He was in the hospital, the Swiss had flown him down and he had lost a lot of weight. You know, he was very, very sick. A special envoy was sent by the British to meet with Tenzing in the hospital, make a personal appeal, and convince him to join them for one last attempt on Everest. And despite uh, the family you know, telling him, like, well, maybe you should think about you know, not going up because you're not well, you're weak right now, he agreed to go with the British in 53. As he descends to base camp from their failed summit attempt, Dawa, despondent, has decided to abandon the expedition. Pete Athens, now at base camp, tries to call him back by radio. Dawa, did, did anything happen at Camp 4 that, that uh, upset you, or what, uh, what happened up there as far as... Uh, any, is there anything you can tell us at all? Yeah, you know, sometimes the goddess tests us pretty hard, you know. It's for me, it wasn't until my fifth expedition that I was able to summit. So it's, it's sometimes hard to say what the goddess knows and what she has in store for us. Sometimes we have to perfect ourselves before she'll let us climb. I lost all the faith in God to yourself.
please Dawa, just come just come back um, you know at your own schedule today and uh, you know please no one no one bears any animosity or ill will towards you we just want you to come back so we can work with you okay yeah I'm coming back to stop I'm sorry for my stupid behavior hey Dawa, we all we all do stupid things and we all get a timeout every now and then right you know all the stupid things that I've done. If they want to get anyone on the summit, the two teams will have to consolidate their efforts and climb the southeast ridge route together. This means Brent and Pete have to abandon their dream of climbing the west ridge. For Pete Athens, this will be his last climb on Everest, so the decision is extremely difficult. I think we just need to fortify our strengths really behind one objective now. Climbing the West Ridge for me would have been a, a really nice way to close 16 expeditions of going to Everest. It's not going to happen. <laughs> What's going to happen is that I'm going to get another chance to to go back to the Southeast Ridge. It's just disappointing. For abandoning the West Ridge, it's, it's painful. It's a dream route. And now to move back over to a route that we've both done that's mainly fixed, it's, you know, it's disappointing. I mean, it's we really have no choice. The weather windows haven't been there. We're beaten up. We need a little bit more support, and, and we've run out of time. Four in the morning at Camp 2, Sherpas and climbers emerge from their tents to begin an ascent to the South Col. The climbers will push a 4,500-foot ascent to the South Col, and the footsteps of Hillary and Tenzing a climbing duo whose strength was legend. I don't think there was any doubt that my father, Ed Hillary, and Tenzing Norgay were the fittest, strongest, most acclimatized, and frankly, performing by far the best of anyone on the mountain. But in 1953, expedition leader John Hunt passed over Hillary and Tenzing and selected two British climbers to be the first to try for the summit. John Hunt had an incredibly difficult situation. This was a British expedition. This was the first ascent of Mount Everest. And I can completely understand that he would have preferred his two British climbers to have summited first. Tenzing was Sherpa and Hillary from New Zealand. So they would have to wait in reserve on the South Col. The first team returned defeated. They made an altitude record. They got very high on the mountain, but they were very intimidated by the ridgeline that lies ahead. The door was now open for Tenzing and Hillary. <sighs> this I call, once I quit, I thought I won't be able to climb this mountain, but I'm back again, and hopefully tomorrow, Mother Goddess will let stand us on the top. There's only a few hours to rest, and it won't be a comfortable night. They'll leave at 11 p.m. It takes about an hour or so just to get everything organized. You know, you lose your headlamp. You can't figure out where you put it, even though you're probably sitting on it. And 11 o'clock rolls around, and it's time to leave. Brent and Pete, with a team of Sherpas, have been breaking trail most of the morning. I was in the lead after a few hours. I'd never seen that much snow, ever. I mean, I was in chest-deep snow. Then, once we got on the ridge, it was blown pretty clear. Pete isn't just breaking trail for his own team. Three other expeditions are moving up behind him. We look back and see this line of 30 or 40 people basically drafting us. What do you make of all these people behind us? Better to be in front. <laughs> <sighs> How long till the South Summit, you reckon? Uh, two hours. Moving at extreme altitude, it's a study in timeless motion. People take two, three, four steps and then they stop and they lean on their ice axe and they're just hyperventilating, dragging air through that regulator from the oxygen bottle.
you've got to try to temper your rate of movement to what you can sustain with your breathing, which isn't very much. And finally we got on South Summit. And then I saw the real summit of Everest. I have seen it only in, uh, in posters, and I read about it only in books. It's kind of some kind of fantasy, and my eyes are full of fear. It is an intimidating ridgeline. It's like a bread knife. It's a serrated knife edge. You can't go along the crest of it. So, in fact, you have to choose one side or the other, and everyone goes on the Nepalese side, away from the corners. It's a scary ridge. It's exposed. There are a lot of places where if you make a mistake, you're going to die. Today, fixed ropes aid climbers in the thin air. But Hillary and Tenzing had no security. What lay ahead was a rock outcrop, later called the Hillary Step. No one knew if it was even climbable. Dad and Tenzing, they were chopping their own steps. They were roped together in true alpine fashion. And when they came to the Hillary Step, Tenzing belayed my father as he climbed his way up. Today, a Sherpa group have gone up and they've fixed a rope, so really quite a different situation. Not nearly as self-reliant and alone as my father and Tenzing were. With some 40 climbers following behind, too many people have clipped into one fixed rope. The tension on the rope is pulling Peter Hillary off the Hillary step. He can't move. With everybody pulling, you cannot move here. You have to stagger people, okay? Tell people to drop down. They're too tight. You guys got to stagger your people. That's a product of the guiding and the commercial trips. People want a stairway to the summit. Half a century ago, Tenzing and Hillary reached the top of the Hillary step and only 100 vertical feet stood between them and history. There is no such thing as reaching the summit first or second. Hillary and Tenzing climbed it for passion and for exploration, not for competition. And I think my father's bottom line was it doesn't matter who climbed up there first. They both relied on each other to get up there. If one was not there, the other one wouldn't be there. My father has never said anything different to me other than that we were a team. We were tied together on a rope. At times, Tenzing had to hold me to prevent me from falling. And similarly, it was my duty to secure him and look after him. We climbed it together. Fifty years after his father's first descent of Everest, Peter Hillary climbs the last steps to the summit. What do you think, Peter? Yeah, it's great to be here. Pete Athens is here for an unprecedented seventh time, more than any other Westerner. There were upwards of 50 people on top. There were people coming up from the north side as well, so it was a little bit of a, an international scene up there. There were Italians and Hungarians. We really couldn't even get a good interview spot for Peter right on the very top, which is what I wanted, which was kind of funny. But we took it in stride, and he was a little, little bit off to the side, which I think worked out better. Base camp, base camp. This is uh, Everest Summit, over. Congratulations on getting to the top. Thank you, Jumling. Everybody is here. Everybody is safe. All five Sherpa members, all three um, foreign members. Um, I'm pretty low on oxygen. We're going to have to move pretty quickly 
to do our calls and get our photos taken over. All right, that's great. Uh, don't stay up there too long. The weather's moving in. So take your pictures, make your calls, and start heading down as soon as possible. Over. Hello? Dad, it's Peter. We're on the summit. Can you hear us? Dad? Hello, are you there, Peter? Dad, it's Peter here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. How are you? Oh, good. Well, we're on the summit of Everest. We've been here for 40 minutes. It's cloudy all around, but we're on top of the wall. It's an amazing outlook, Dad. Yeah, how was the hill reset? Not only the Hillary step, but the climb up onto the south summit. It's really steep and really exposed. And I feel really emotional about being up here because you guys, what you did, well, nearly 50 years ago, it's just incredible. I mean, we had fixed ropes all the way. You guys cut steps basically into the unknown and up that jolly Hillary step. To see Peter call. Sir Ed from the summit, it was amazing. Anyway, Dad, don't worry, I'm not going to do it again. It was sort of a bittersweet moment for me because, you know, I wanted to talk to my father and, you know, tell him how proud I was of him and how proud I was to be on the summit again. There are all sorts of questions I have about how they climbed because that was 40 years ago and they have no support after the high camp, no Sherpas breaking trail for them, no fixed line. Sorry, Pete, I'm getting a bit emotional. Oof. Well, here I am sitting on the summit of Mount Everest, speaking to people that matter most to me. I can only believe it. I'll try not just to cry the whole time, man. <laughs> Those who have stood on the highest point on earth return with hard-earned wisdom, having caught a brief glimpse into what it might have been like for the two men who were first. I feel a very strong kinship with Tenzing. He always approached this mountain not as a soldier to an enemy, not as someone trying to have some type of conquest but something like a child that climbs into the lap of its mother. I don't think he ever came here and, and forced his will on this mountain. I think he came to this mountain with compassion and love, and I think that's why he was successful. I was very happy, and I said, hey, look, Mother Goddess, this is my first and last time. I'm not gonna come back. Anyway, thank you very much to keep everyone safe and to let us stand uh, on the top of it.